you so much for the music. Thank you to the tributes for being here with us today. It's good to see you. Once again, on behalf of the congregation and for your con uh, your mission team that came up, thanks so much for all the work that you did for us. Mm -hmm. Deeply appreciate that. Yeah, yes. yeah, I would like to introduce Ray and Terry Truby from mm -hmm. Florida. Yeah. They live in Florida now anyway, they're not from Florida. And uh, they were here earlier in August with the mission team. They came out of Florida. Some of you got to see them and meet them over at uh, Lexington. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were here, cleaning the carpets out here, and they took care of cleaning the carpets. And we want to thank them for that service. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks. Praise God for that. I invite you, everyone, to turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 21. For those of you who have not been able to be with us on Wednesday nights, we've been going through uh, 1 Samuel. And so I was looking at this passage and realized there's a little bit more to uh, this passage, perhaps, than just uh, what we would cover normally on a Wednesday night. And so that's why we're looking at it on Sunday morning. But the, the pattern of what we've been looking at is, is that the people of Israel had fallen away from what God had told them to do and what God had told them to be. And so uh, having been uh, what we would call today out of church for uh, a long period of time and not up on sound doctrine, when the Philistines attacked, they uh, all kind of came together and said, hey, here's a great idea. Let's get a religious artifact, the Ark of the Covenant. Let's take it from where it belongs. So let's take it out on the battlefield and Surely God would not allow us to be defeated on a battlefield if we have the Ark of the Covenant because he would not allow any harm to come to the Ark of the Covenant. They were partially right in that. God did not allow any harm to come to the Ark of the Covenant. He did allow them to experience defeat, to show that you cannot play around with the things of God. and You cannot make light uh, and use him as a, uh, a religious symbol just to get your way when you want uh, something. It was a hard lesson for them, and it was one that took a long time, as it turns out, for it to really sink in. But as we've gone through that on Wednesday nights, I wanted you to see one thing. God is a God of grace. He's a God of restoration. He's a God of redemption. Because though the Ark of the Covenant was captured, he saw to it that it was returned to Israel. And if you've been with us, or if you've read these uh, passages in chapter 5, chapter 6 before, you know that the way he returned it was quite miraculous. And so where we pick up in verse 21 is uh, the Ark of the Covenant has returned. But it doesn't come back exactly to the place where it needs to be uh, immediately. The people had fallen into idolatry and they tried to use the things of God in a superstitious way. So he removed the object of their superstition, let them face defeat. And, and that's a warning for us to be walking with him and trusting him and, and not just uh, waiting until things go wrong and then suddenly hitting our knees and, and praying, God, get me out of the mess that I've gotten myself into. Better to walk with him. So as uh, the ark is returned, they weren't quite ready for it yet. If you have found uh, 1 Samuel 6, verse 21, I invite you to stand, if you're able to, to read God's word this morning, to honor the reading of his word. And uh, if you're not able to stand, just uh, stand up in your heart. It says, Then they sent messengers to the people of kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your place. So the men of kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord. They took it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to guard the ark of the Lord. Almighty God, as we come before you today, we come before you wanting to hear from you and be reminded about the need to walk with you and the blessing that comes from walking with you. Thank you, Lord, for all the times that you have protected us as we have drawn near to you and walked with you. You've seen us through some very uh, dark times and you've seen us through some very good times and we praise you for that. I ask as we look at your word today and the many passages that we're going to look at, your, uh, at in your word today, that you would speak to us and that you would encourage us and that the very presence 
of your spirit in us and your word coming through our ears and, and into our hearts today, Lord, would change us, would grow us, and would help us to be more like Jesus. For everything that we do here, everything we want to see accomplished here is all about lifting up Jesus in this place. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. So the ark is returned. It's not returned to Jerusalem. It's not returned to its rightful, play, rightful place yet. Uh, in the meantime, there's going to be a man named Eliezer who's going to guard the ark. And I know I've read this passage before, and you probably have too, if you have a, a pattern of reading through the scripture. Maybe some folks read the Bible through every year or something like this. You've probably read this passage, but you understand how it is when you read the scripture. Sometimes a word or a phrase will just pop out at you that you've never really noticed before or paid attention to. And, and when it said uh, that Eliezer was to guard the ark of the Lord. This ark is important in what it represents. The ark of the covenant was to represent the very presence of God among his people. The ark that contains several important artifacts from God's work in their history. The ark which was overlaid with a golden uh, top uh, guarded by two golden figures of cherubim was... Uh, the place where the high priest once a year would sprinkle the blood on the day of atonement. It was the very picture of what Jesus would do for us. This isn't a mere article of furniture. This is an important piece. It's been captured by the enemy. It's now been returned. What we're going to find out in verse 2, which, uh, Lord willing, next time we uh, gather on Wednesday night, we'll pick up in verse 2, but... I'm just going to borrow one thing from there. It, it says that Eliezer had to do this for 20 years. It wasn't a week or two until they got all the preparations made. It was 20 years that he had this assignment to guard the ark. What a responsibility. What a responsibility. I don't know what he would have to guard it from, who was going to harm it or misuse it, but he had a solemn responsibility. And so, as soon as um, I read that, I thought about, what is it that God has asked you to guard for Him? The Bible tells us there are actually a few things. But what is it that God has asked you to guard for Him? You know, the Bible says we have a treasure within us. We're jars of clay, but we have a treasure. What is it? Or what are things that God has asked you to guard for Him? Well, there are some things that the Lord expects you to guard. Do you know what any of them are? Uh, the first one that comes to my mind is actually described in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. And take your Bibles and turn to that passage. We are told in uh, Proverbs that there's something specifically that we're to guard. And it's very important. This is not to be taken lightly. Although I suspect that a lot of people in our society don't recognize the importance of this. Especially with all of the many messages that we get bombarded with in our society. This passage says, above all else. Does that phrase make it sound like this might be just a tad important? Does this phrase make it sound like maybe this is something we ought to be paying attention to? Well, what is, above all else, guard what? Your heart. Why? Because it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. That is the very important, uh, central part of your life. And it's interesting the way the, the progression of this passage works, and we'll spend a lot of time here in Proverbs 4, but uh, just to say this, back in verse 20, we discover that it's important what we listen to. Okay? What we listen to. Not just the noise and the, the commotion or the thoughts or the ideas or the things that kind of float by us, but I'm making a distinction here between what you hear and what you listen to. And you know there's a difference. You, you talk to people all the time, and they not hear what you say, but they are listening. Uh, and you usually discover that a little bit further on down the road, don't you? 
There's a difference between hearing and listening. And here it says it's important what we listen to. That is what we take in. What we believe will affect us. Will affect us. He says, you know, be careful. Listen closely to my words. Keep them within your heart, verse 21. Uh, they, they will be life and health to you. Uh, verse 22, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart. Be careful what you believe. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful of your source. You know? Now there's all different kinds of ways that you can uh, understand this and, and apply it in your life. You know, you've got to be careful uh, people that you listen to because there are folks out there that they will put you down. They will say bad things about you and if you're not careful you begin listening, taking it in, believing that instead of what God says about you. Instead of uh, how God describes you and, and how God portrayed His love for you and that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And there's lots of other things. There's a lot of things about God Himself that, that people talk about and promote that aren't correct. A lot of folks get their theology from some shaky places. One of them is the internet. You can find anything and everything on the internet, but most of what you read on the internet is not true, contrary to popular belief. A lot of folks go, oh, well, I read that, and so it must be true. People believe all kinds of stuff. The Bible says, be careful. Guard your heart. It's the wellspring. Pollute it, and the rest of your life is going to be affected in a bad way. Jesus talked about the importance of uh, of having right belief, sound doctrine, and good belief, understanding, and, and coming to Him and understanding His Word and, and, and applying that, and having our focus on the right things. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So it's important what we value. It's important what we strive for. It, it's important what our priorities are to seek the kingdom of God first and foremost above anything else. You know, it's important. What do you treasure? What are you looking to? You know, that's a serious question to really to stop and think about. Do we individually seek first the kingdom of God? Are the things of God important to us? If believing Him, you know, Abraham believed Him and it was credited to him, uh, to him as righteousness because he believed the promises of Believing Him, listening to Him, obeying Him, guarding our heart, not letting those wrong beliefs come in. Because there's all kinds of folks out there that will tell you something that's wrong. There's all kinds of philosophies out there that are wrong, that are not true. And it matters. The outcome matters. Uh, Warren Wiersbe put it this uh, way. Outlook determines outcome. Your outlook determines your outcome. Abraham is the example that he uses. Abraham was a friend of God and he walked by faith because he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Hebrews 11.10. He walked with God. He had his eyes focused on the things of God. He, he was looking for that city that God was leading him to. On the other hand, Lot was a friend of the world. He walked by sight. His eyes were on a different city, the city of Sodom, where fire fell from heaven and very nearly scorched him. Everybody has some vision before them that, that helps uh, to determine their values, their actions, and their plans. It would be wise to do what the psalmist in uh, Psalm 119 said, Lord, turn my eyes away from worthless things. I don't know how many folks are focused on worthless things. Things that in the end aren't going to matter. Things in the end that are going to burn up. You know, God said our, our life at the end is, is going to be evaluated. And it's going to be tested by a fire. And things that are wood and hay and straw and stubble, they're going to burn up. They're going to be nothing. They're worthless things. Oh, but there are things that are like gold and silver and precious gems that are going to be refined by the fire. Not burned up, but refined by the fire. 
made better. That's the kinds of things that we ought to be focused on. Isn't it? If you're looking unto Jesus, then, then keep on. <laughs> keep on in your walk with Him. Don't look back. Don't look around. Don't go on any detours. Keep forward. Keep on focusing on God. Do you need to ask the Lord just to reveal what's in your heart? To reveal what you're focused on? To clean your heart? To strengthen your heart? Guard your heart. If God shows you some things, deal with those things. Jesus talked about our hearts as well. And he was talking to his disciples one day in Matthew 16. If you want to turn over to Matthew 16 and verse 6. He was talking to his disciples about uh, this matter of the heart. And in a way, he was talking about guarding the heart and not getting focused on the wrong things. Not listening to the wrong things. Things that might be evil, things that might be misleading, things that would be destructive, things that would be a hindrance to their life. He, he just put it in a, a, a word picture there that they were kind of struggling uh, dealing with. In uh, Matthew 16, the disciples and Jesus were setting out for a trip. And uh, they, were, they were packing for the trip, and then they were on, on their way when they realized they'd forgotten something. Now, when you pack for a trip and you get ready, uh, some people begin uh, packing their suitcase days and weeks in advance. Some of us wait till the night before and start throwing things in, okay? Whichever your pattern is, you can identify with where the disciples were on this. They were packing. They probably had a list of things that they needed to take with them. They were used to this routine, so it wasn't brand new to them. And so they, they, maybe one person thought somebody else had taken that uh, number off the list and had already taken care of it, but they're, they're underway and they forgot the bread. That's kind of surprising in a way because bread was the, the basic staple of life, okay? They forgot lunch. And there were no McDonald's to swing into on the way, okay? They didn't have that. This was important. How do you forget the bread? But in the middle of that, Jesus wants to teach them a spiritual truth. So he's going to start with something that they can understand, hopefully, that they can relate to, and he's going to apply a spiritual truth to it. And in uh, Matthew 16, it says, When they went across the lake, verse 5, the disciples forgot to take bread. Verse 6, be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard. There's that word again. This time he says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. Well, no, it really wasn't. Again, Jesus was trying to talk about something that they could relate to. But you know, sometimes we're a little slow on the uptake and he has to come back and explain things a little bit more uh, to them. And, and he'll do that. And the gist of it is this. Yeast often refers to evil in the scripture. Or things that are wrong, things that are bad, things that can affect us in a bad way. Compromise, for instance, could be a, like a yeast. A, a little bit gets into the dough, and it doesn't take much yeast to affect a whole batch of dough. And it can affect us in, in a bad way. And, and so we're to guard our hearts. What are we to guard against? Well, one thing is we're to guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because a little bit can mislead a person. A little bit of error can trip up a whole family. A little bit of error can, can cause a community or a state or even a whole nation to go off the rails. Doesn't sometimes take very much and can lead people away from God. And that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees ultimately were doing. They were leading people away from God. Though they claimed to be there to help folks, they were actually leading people away from Him. And Jesus said, be on your guard. Well, how do you guard your heart against the wrong teaching of religious pride or the wrong teaching of worldly ways? Well, first, you keep your eyes focused on Jesus, right? We sort of already said that. When you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you can go through some incredible experiences. 
Peter knew that. One day, Jesus uh, was not with them in the boat, and they were crossing the lake, and there was a storm, and looked up, and, and they were scared out of their wits when they saw something they thought was a ghost coming towards them. And uh, Shortly after that, they discovered it was Jesus, and he's walking across the, the wind-swept waves, you know. I just can't imagine what that looked like, but uh, it scared them pretty good at first. And Peter decided, Lord, I want to come out on the water with you. Jesus said, come on out. As long as he had his eyes fixed on Jesus, he was doing just fine. When he took his eyes off of Jesus and he started looking at the waves and what was causing the waves, that wind and all those other things, what happened to him? He began to sink. So first and foremost, to guard our heart and guard against those things uh, that would pollute our lives, the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that would pollute that wellspring. We need to make sure we're keeping our eyes on Jesus and not listening to somebody else or listening to a wrong teaching or looking even at our circumstances and drawing the wrong conclusions. Oh, something didn't go well today. God must not love me anymore. That's a wrong conclusion. People draw that every single day. We have that tendency. Oh, well, God didn't answer the prayer the way I thought he should. So therefore, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Not on the wind and the waves. Not on the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Not on all of the things that are going on around you. Or your disappointments and setbacks in life. And there will be those things in all of our lives. It is a part of living in a fallen world. Another thing to guard hard is uh, not to uh, focus on what other people are doing, whether it be good or bad. Because sometimes we draw a wrong conclusion, like I just said, based on our circumstances. Sometimes we draw the wrong conclusions because we got our eyes focused on other people and what they're doing. And uh, probably an ideal place to look for this is in Luke chapter 9. We want to turn there, Luke 9, and I'll start reading in verse 49 in just a moment. Um, there's two lessons that Jesus taught his disciples. It, it's recorded in Mark's gospel, but in Luke's gospel, they're, they're one right after the other. And I can't help but think that's for a reason. Uh, sometimes you can focus on people <coughs> and, and, and you get off track and you get your eyes off of Jesus because your, your eyes are on people. And that's a dangerous place to be, and we've got to be careful about that. Uh, but even sometimes it can be uh, maybe some pride that comes in, and, and that could be like the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because they were very proud religious folks, and we've got to be careful about that. And in Luke 9, 49, John uh, is talking, he's, he's speaking to Jesus, and he says this, Master, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. There's another church down the street, Jesus, and they're not one of us. Stop them. Keep them from doing things in your name, Jesus. And Jesus said, oh, John, I'm so glad you brought that to my attention. I'm so glad I'm going to run right down there and, and I'm going to lock the door of their church and make sure nobody can get in. Well, let's see what he really said. Verse 50. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For whoever is not against you is for you. You've got to remember not to be looking at other people and judging them, looking down our nose because they're not one of us. Maybe they're different. And if they're needing our prayers, then pray for them. Pray that God help them. Pray that God bless their ministry. Pray, pray that God bless their mission work, wherever they may be, down the street or around the world, in a big city someplace that doesn't resemble anywhere like our world or in some other country that we can't even begin to identify with or wherever it might be in our backyard. Pray for people. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And do what God said to do. Stay in step with Jesus. Preach the word. He'll take care of his kingdom business. He's been doing it for a long time, and he's been doing a pretty good job. Well, sometimes we get our, our eyes on people for a, a different reason. 
Sometimes uh, it's because people are doing bad things. And we get all discouraged and, and all upset and all twisted around about that. Shortly after the statement that Jesus made, whoever's not against you is for you, uh, there were some Samaritans who treat Jesus in an unkind way. So whereas in the first part of the passage there were people who were doing good things, or uh, doing things in Jesus' name, uh, verse uh, 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead. He went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Okay. Now they're treating Jesus unkindly. And there's a lot of folks in our world who treat Jesus unkindly, treat his followers followers in unkind ways, who don't listen to the things that Jesus is saying to do. They don't listen to his call to them for salvation. They don't listen to his pleading with them to, to follow his ways. And so John, James and John this time, the sons of thunder, saw this and they asked, Lord, what do you, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Jesus said, oh, James and John, thank you so much for calling this to my attention. I was completely unaware. Yes, they're, they're being rotten and miserable. Let's call down fire from heaven. Now well, let's look and see what Jesus really said. He turned and he rebuked them. He went on to another village. Well, yeah, only two times that I can think of off the top of my head that Jesus rebuked his disciples once is when he made, uh, once when the disciples attempted to cause uh, the children not to come to Jesus. And the other one was here. You know, people doing bad stuff. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on his ways, not your ways. You know, follow him. Follow him. How you guard against the Sadducees and the Pharisees is not being that judgmental critical. Because that's the kind of thing that the Pharisees and and the Sadducees did. That, that was the critical spirit that they had, and, and Jesus rebuked them for it. Instead, we're to walk with him, and as we do, over time, discernment will become uh, built up in you as a follower of Jesus. You'll become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and his ways, and you'll be better able to be the church. That is working together. Uh, one of the things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees did was they were divisive. That's why there are two groups, Pharisees and Sadducees. They're always arguing and fighting over things, and both were in a power struggle all the time. But Jesus called us to be the church. Someone said, a single century does not protect a castle, and that's why we need the church and the church family, and to be a part of building up the church as well. Guard against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and that yeast, that long thinking. And then, 1 Corinthians 16, be on guard, stand firm, and be men of courage and strong. 1 Corinthians 16 is the last chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. In a lot of ways, it summarizes what the entire book is saying. You know, to be on guard, that is always alert against the spiritual enemies that might slip in and try to destroy us. What are those enemies? Well, you can just walk through the book of 1 Corinthians. There are divisions. There's pride. There's sin. There's disorder. Bad theology. And so forth. These are things that we need to guard against. To make sure they don't reach our heart because we believed them and believed in them. They needed to stand true for what they believed. Again, uh, Warren Wearsby, the rest of his quote was this, Life is too short and too precious to be wasted on temporary and trivial. You know, those things that we do for God that matter. The fourth thing to guard against, or to guard rather, is that which has been entrusted to you. And that's in 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. Here, as Paul is ending this first letter to Timothy, he says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. You know? 
Guard what has been entrusted to you. What has been entrusted to Timothy? What has been entrusted to us? The gospel. The gospel. We want to make it all about everything else. We want to major on all the minors. And yet the Bible again and again calls us to make the main thing the main thing. To make the main thing the main thing. And the gospel is the main thing. Everything that you have learned from the gospel is a priceless treasure. Guard it. Every lesson that God has ever taught you, every promise that you have ever discovered in His Word, everything that God has ever ministered to you through His Word is a priceless treasure. Guard it. If you had a treasure chest at home full of gold and silver and jewels and um, maybe some other forms of wealth, I doubt you're going to leave it open on the front lawn and leave your house. And it probably ain't going to be there when you come back, is it? Oh, no, you, you, you go to great lengths to protect it. That's why we build banks with vaults, steel, and concrete, and all this stuff, because it's important. We're going to guard it. Well, there's nothing more important than the gospel. Guard it. And finally, in 2 Timothy, in chapter 2, verse 14, we see one more thing. Keep on reminding them. Keep on reminding them these things. Hold on to. Guard the good deposit that is yours. Verse 14 says, Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. This, this stuff that we're to guard, just like Eliezer was to guard the ark, and God has entrusted these things to you to guard, it's hard to do in our own strength on a day-to-day -day basis. But guess what? You don't have to. God will help you. God will help you every step of the way to guard these things with the help of the Holy Spirit. He'll help you through His Word. He'll help you through the presence of His Spirit. He'll help you through the presence of brothers and sisters in the local church. That's what He designed it to be. Hold on to it. What do you have to guard? What has God spoken to you about today? Do you need to, to take some actions to guard your heart today? Uh, there, there, there's some weak points in the defenses there. We need to, to shore them up. Maybe God has revealed something to you today to guard your heart or to take steps to guard the gospel or the things that you've learned from God or the things in your walk. How will you guard them by keeping your eyes on Jesus and developing that discernment, being a part of the local church. Why will you guard them? Because it's so very important. Because there's an enemy that wants to steal it from you. Because there are billions of people who need to hear about Jesus. Those are important reasons why we ought to be guarding our heart and guarding these things that we've discussed today, guarding the gospel. And taking our place as a guardian of the gospel in this day and time, in this age. Will you stand with Jesus, encouraged to promote that message? Will you be like Eliezer and guard these important things for the Lord today? To say, I will no longer give into, you fill in the blank, what has God put on your heart? Or... I will take these steps to guard my heart, to be a guardian of the gospel, to guard what has been entrusted to me. You fill in the blank. What has the Holy Spirit said to you? And friend, if you don't have anything to guard because Jesus hasn't come into your life, then the very first step you need to take is to trust Him as your Savior. To realize that it matters you have a Creator. We have all sinned and fallen short of His perfect standard and glory. But praise God, He sent His Son to die for us so that we could have eternal life instead of perishing. You do that by accepting Him and then following Him every day the rest of your life, and it'll be a great treasure. At the end of life, we'll understand just how great a treasure it is. Lord God, I thank You for Your Word today. But well, really, it was more here today than we had an opportunity to get through. Just two short verses to start with, and really just one phrase to guard something. What is it You call us to guard? in our own lives, to guard our hearts, make sure that our testimony is going to be good, and 
make sure that we keep our eyes on you, to make sure that, that you're leading us to guard the gospel and the guardians of this incredible gift, a treasure in a jar of clay, but a treasure nonetheless. This incredible message of the gospel and the Savior. Oh, help us to stand firm for you today. Because there are billions of people who need to know about Jesus. We need to make that decision.